Hey everyone, so this Unit 8 video is about uh, parenting styles and the most prevailing widely accepted theory on parenting styles. Um, you know, obviously if I asked you guys, like, what are some characteristics of good and bad parenting, uh, you guys could give a variety of opinions on, you know, what good parenting looks like and the attributes and qualities they have. You certainly could give me plenty of good, uh, you know, examples of attributes and qualities and characteristics of bad parenting. Um, and there is more than one parenting style theory. There's a lot more theories out there on uh, how to define and quantify parenting. However, we are going to go with which is considered the most widely accepted one uh, that is often currently taught, and also the one that is definitely most likely to appear on the AP exam. And generally, in most years, there is at least one question about the parenting styles that usually does appear on the AP exam. So, um, you see here in the notes, I have listed all four of the parenting styles. However, I do want to actually show you a couple of charts or a couple of diagrams as well. And so, um, how, uh, so her name is Diana Baumreind. Um, make sure you attach Diana Baumreind's name um, to a list of um, the, the four most common types of parenting styles. Um, she originally created three. Uh, in the form of authoritative, authoritarian, permissive, and then a fourth one, uninvolved, was actually la uh, added at a later time. Um, you'll notice by this chart, this chart gives you a description of the four parenting styles, uh, and in the notes I will show you that they do have alternative names. Uh, some of them are known by multiple names. Uh, that can be somewhat confusing. However, this chart, I think, is also handy because it does show you characteristics and attributes and adjectives that are often associated with the four parenting styles, but it also shows you how they are divided in the first place. So, uh, there are, according to Diana Baumrein, there are two key elements that define a parenting style. How demanding are the parents? and how responsive or how warm are the parents. So it's based on either having a high or low demand out of your children and having high or low responsiveness and warmth towards your children. And so that ultimately gives the four parenting styles. So what do I mean by demanding? Um, demandingness or the demand level you have for your children is basically defined as the amount of expectations, goals, um, uh, aspirations um, that you have for them. You know, what kind of goals, what kind of expectations do you set for them? Uh, what kind of things do you envision for them in terms of accomplishment and things that they are expected to be able to do? And then when I say responsiveness or warmth, um, that is usually defined in ways such as to what, um, to what level do you make yourself available to them? To, to be able to be reached out to by them. Uh, you know, what kind of empathy, sympathy, relatableness, connectiveness, um, what type of support do you offer them uh, to help them meet the possibly high or low demands that you have for them? So what that ultimately does is produce four uh, parenting styles. Uh, so let me go back to the notes. Uh, and please do know that, again, if you look at the Unit 8, the, uh, the description below uh, of this video, if you look at the description below, uh, there's multiple links um, for AP review and also Unit 8 materials. Uh, one of the videos that I'll be linking below uh, sends you to a link that basically analyzes uh, parenting styles uh, based on Diana Baumrein's theory and also gives you some examples of uh, characters um, I believe from TVs and movies that also show you the parenting styles in action. Um, so essentially you have four parenting styles, three of which are considered to be various levels of not ideal or poor, and then one that is considered to be the good parenting style. So we have one good parenting style, three that have varying degrees of negativity to them. Do please keep in mind, this is all correlation only. Many of you, for example, could have been raised under a less than ideal parenting style. This statistically says it is more likely the, for the child to um, not have a great outcome, and you could have been just fine, and you may be just fine. So we're talking about statistics and correlation here. We're not talking about guarantee. However, there is definitely one parenting style that appears to be the best, and the other three have a lot of uh, downsides or negativities to them. 
So real quickly, um, the three negative parenting styles are authoritarian, which we will come back to in a minute. Uh, it is considered to have high demand, but low responsiveness. Then the opposite of that is also considered a bad parenting style. I have seen it called permissive. I have seen it called laissez-faire, which in French means hands-off. It's often referred to as an economics term. Uh, hands-off, permissive, and indulgent. Um, that one is considered to be bad because it is low of demand, but it is highly responsive. Um, the fourth bad parenting style, it's sometimes referred to as absent, uninvolved, neglectful, and in some ways, the reason why it was added later is because in some regards, it's not even really a parenting style at all because the absence, uninvolved, neglect basically means the parent is not a parent. Uh, they have essentially checked out of their parental responsibility. So that one is considered bad and it is considered low on demand and low on um, um, responsiveness and warmth. And then that does lead us to one good parenting style. Again, you could have and you may have been raised under an authoritarian or a permissive or a neglectful or uninvolved parenting and you may have been fine and you may be fine, but statistically the odds are not necessarily in a child's favor for those. So the best parenting style, which does not guarantee the child will turn out great, but it does create the best potential for the child to be uh, successful is what is called authoritarian authoritative or democratic. Now, um, the term democratic is a little misleading. Uh, it's definitely not a democracy. The parents certainly have, um, you know, uh, veto power. They certainly are in charge. So democratic is a little bit of a misleading term. Authoritative is probably a more accurate way of looking at it. Uh, one thing I would warn you about, please make sure you don't confuse authoritarian parenting, which is demanding but not responsive, with authoritative uh, authoritarian is also considered bad. Authoritative is considered good parenting, and it's good parenting in part because, yes, it is demanding. However, it is also high on responsiveness and warmth. And so authoritative democratic gives you the best of both worlds, where, yes, the parents do have high expectations for their children. However, they also are there as a support system and are reliable and empathetic and make reasonable demands and are warm and responding to their kids' needs to help them reach those high and lofty goals. The other three are missing key elements. So let me go back um, to the slide. You can see some of the descriptions of all of them. So let me go through um, all four of them. And I would also point out um, many of you may be in situations where, for example, uh, when I describe these to you, you may realize that you and your siblings have actually received different parenting. Um, that can definitely be a cause for concern, especially if it's based on gender. Um, there's also examples where you may realize that your parents used to be one type of parenting style and then have changed over time. That could be good or bad, depending on which ones they've changed to. You also may be in a situation that's quite common where you may have two different parents with two different parenting styles. Uh, you may have situations, for example, where dads may be more authoritative, moms may be, or sorry, dads may be more authoritarian, and moms may be more permissive, um, depending on if it's a, for example, a son, um, if it's a daughter, it could be reversed. You may find situations where dad may be the authoritarian and mom's more authoritative. You may have situations where in your single parent household where you may have an authoritative authoritarian parent. Uh, one or the other, and the other parent is uninvolved. It, there, there's so many different combinations, um, and, and that's not really what this, this episode is about. But I do want to point out, if you find that there's some inconsistencies between your parents or a parent-step-parent or separated parents that are both involved in your life, things of that nature, uh, that can def that's, that's definitely not uncommon by any means. It's not ideal, but it definitely does occur. 
So anyway, let's go through the three negative parenting styles and then talk about how it affects the child statistically. And then we'll talk about the good parenting style and how it affects the child statistically. So authoritarian parent, uh, chances are most of you, if you don't have the good authoritative parent, the most likely ones you're tending to probably have is going to likely be an authoritarian. Authoritarian parents are very demanding, but they're not very responsive. Uh, I believe in the video, one of the characters that they pull um, to show an example of an authoritarian parent uh, is Red Foreman from that 70s show, where he has lots of demands, he has rigid rules, he's not flexible, he's very demanding, and he's also swift to punish. He doesn't show love, he doesn't show connectiveness, he doesn't show emotion, he doesn't show um, support. He basically just says, this is what you're going to do, and if you don't, you're going to have trouble, and it's going to be swift, and it's going to be quick punishment. And so that is called authoritarian parenting. Uh, sometimes another example you'll see is now that they've coined the phrase like tiger mom, uh, where you have a tiger mom that is very, very hands-on. And unfortunately, they're very demanding, but they're not very loving or supportive, and they don't provide a lot of emotional support or emotional empathy. That, that's another term you've heard before, probably. So that's, some, for an example, authoritarian. So classic examples you'll get from authoritarian are phrases such as, because I said so, you know, you have to listen to me, I don't have to explain myself to you, this is not up for debate, uh, you know, I'm the parent, you're the child, you'll do it, you know, I don't have to explain myself, you'll do it because I said so. Those are all classic authoritarian statements, and when you're dealing with smaller children, authoritarian parenting might be more necessary because not everything needs to or can be always explained. But especially once you start dealing with tweens and teenagers, authoritarian parenting becomes difficult because often authoritarian parents are demanding. They have lots of demands out of grades, uh, behavior, expectations, accomplishments, but they provide little to no love and support and responsiveness to help their kids get them. They're just basically blindly expected to follow those roles, follow those things without thinking about them, without arguing, without talking back, without offering opinions. None of those things matter. Authoritarian parents may say your opinion matters, but they don't. They may say they may take things into consideration, but they really don't. They don't provide any real warmth or love, but they do expect you to follow rigid rules and expectations and goals. And if you don't, they don't want to. They don't want to hear about why you didn't make you know, make them. They don't want to hear about why you didn't reach them. Often, if you get in trouble, they won't even ask for your side of the story. They don't care about those things. They don't take into account. Uh, they may you know punish swiftly and harshly and excessively uh, with little to no um, you know little to no support on your part, no defense, things of that nature. So it can be very difficult. Difficult. Um, so um, they often tell you exactly what you have to do, and they tell you how to do it. There's little to no flexibility here. So often what can happen to children under authoritarian parenting is they do tend to, for example, they do tend to do well in school, but they tend to do uh, well in school more out of fear uh, uh, of failing um, their parents than anything, not because they actually want to necessarily do well. They're often afraid of what happens if they don't. Um, they're often respectful, for example, to teachers and authority figures, but again, it's mostly out of fear, um, not out of like, um, not out of respect. Uh, um, often children that grow under authoritarian parenting, uh, they often have very low self-esteem. Uh, it can make it very hard for them to empathize or sympathize with other people. And that's largely because they've been told that their feelings don't matter, uh, that their opinions don't matter, that their views don't matter. They also tend to have difficulty making decisions for themselves. Uh, they can have dependency issues because they're used to always having to do whatever they're told and not to think for themselves. And so it can definitely be very difficult uh, for authoritarian uh, children. Some of them tend to, after a while, start to rebel. And the authoritarian parents may view that as, a, well, this is a reason why we need to be even more authoritarian. But in reality, what's happening is the same reason why people rebel under a regime, under a dictatorship. You don't get to be a dictator and then wonder why the people are rebelling or being sneaky or lying or being deceptive. So authoritarian parents often create an environment where their kids are afraid of them and they, they perform out of a sense of uh, duty, not out of a sense of respect. And then as a result, they also may become, like I said, very unsympathetic towards others. Um, and they may become very sneaky uh, because they, um, they need to breathe. Uh, they feel suffocated. Uh, now, the exact opposite of this is permissive parenting. 
um, permissive parenting. Uh, you'll notice here it says you just do what it like. Basically, the parents are like you're in charge, like you're the boss. Just do whatever the heck you want. Uh, permissive parents, um, um, they don't have any real demands out of their children, but they do have plenty of warmth and responsiveness for their kids. So an example of this is um, from from characters would be think of like Regina George's mom from Mean Girls. She wants to be her daughter's friend. She doesn't want to, you know, she wants to be liked. She, she wants to be seen um, as a friend to her daughter, as a sister almost, not as the actual mother. So, you know, Regina George, if you, uh, you think about it, she, she gets to do whatever the heck she wants for the most part. There's no real accountability. Uh, there's no punishment for her actions. Uh, her parent, you know, her mom doesn't really have any high goals or demands for her. She has she caters to all of her whims, anything she wants, anything she needs. Now, if you think this is the kind of parenting you want, you are wrong. Like those of you under authoritarian parenting, you definitely want less of that, but you don't want permissive. That is an overcorrection. So often what happens with permissive children um, is they become often spoiled and entitled um, because they're used to getting what they want. They're used to doing whatever they want. Often their parents may try to punish them, but they know that those punishments won't last or they won't stick. Their parents often won't follow through with them. Many of their parents like basically excuse or overlook bad behaviors or look at things that they do and they just kind of look the other way or, or forgive them. Um, they don't have any real high demands for their kids. They don't have a lot of responsibilities for their kids. Um, they definitely cater to any of their kids' whims and needs, so as a result, the kids often do become rather spoiled and entitled. Um, from a teacher standpoint, often permissive kids are some of the worst kids to have to deal with in school because often they resist and are extremely aggressive and disobedient and um, defiant against anyone who tries to become an authority figure. And so sometimes you'll have this mindset where the kids are like, you know, you're not my parents. You can't tell me what to do. And in the back of many, um, for example, adults' minds, they're like, mm, well, if your mom or dad maybe actually did have structure in the home and actually did make you accountable and make you do may, actually made you you know have to you know understand that there's repercussions for actions and decisions um that i wouldn't have to do this i wouldn't have to be this way you know if your if your parents did that and so permissive kids for example um they tend to have very for example positive self-esteem uh, even to the point where they may become narcissistic uh, because they're often encouraged to explore, you know, being themselves. And so they often have high self-esteem to the point where they're entitled and indulging and, and narcissistic. However, they also tend to basically reject any attempts by authority figures to help, you know, rein in them for control and respect and understanding that there's consequence to their actions because, again, they're not used to that. Um, permissive kids often tend to overly indulge in things such as drugs and alcohol, and they often may get involved in criminal behavior very early because, again, they're not used to not getting what they want, so they're often, you know, do whatever they feel they want to do without caring about rules and expectations, and as a result of that, they do tend to get in trouble. They, they have a higher risk for things such as addiction. They tend to get in trouble with the law faster. Uh, they tend to be, for example, suspended more. They definitely don't tend to do as well in school uh, because there's really no expectations from the parents for the kids to really um, to actually do anything. There's no real high demands for goals and things like that. So that can be very difficult. Um, uninvolved uh, parents, uh, like I said, technically this is sometimes not even considered a parenting style. This was added later. Um, I don't even remember, do not quote me on this, but I don't believe this was actually even proposed by Baumrind. I believe this was added later by other researchers into her theory. Uh, but an uninvolved parent is both not demanding and not responsive. The, the parents have no demands out of the kid and they have no responsiveness to the kid. And that's mostly because the uninvolved, neglectful parent, um, they basically are or absent. Sometimes they're called absent parents. And again, I apologize. There's so many different names for these. But uninvolved, neglectful, absent parent, they have checked out of par parental responsibilities. Now, I do want to point out there's a couple of different reasons why the parents may be uninvolved. Um, it might not always be the parent's fault. So one example where this might not be the parent's fault 
is, for example, that the parent may be a single parent who also has to work a lot and not be home hardly at all and cannot necessarily afford a ton of supervision or support. And so the kid is basically left to fend for themselves. And if the child is the oldest of siblings, that child may then have to take on the responsibility of having to raise their siblings uh, like a parent, um, which obviously no 10, 12, 14 year old should be expected nor would likely do a great job at doing. However, there are certainly uninvolved parental situations that can involve things such as a deadbeat parent or a parent um, who, like, you know, is so involved in things such as partying and drugs and alcohol and basically leave their kids alone for days on end. And the kid is essentially the more adult like figure in the situation or they are asked to raise themselves. Uh, I do want to point out if it's a single parent household with good parenting, that it, the kid will be fine. Research has shown that you don't have to have two parents in a home for the kid to do well. That is a misconception. But the problem is, is that while a single parent home with the right parenting style would be great, often the dilemma of a single parent home is having to work out of the home so much that they might not really be around to do the quality parenting that they wish they could. So no matter what the reasons are, the uninvolved kid is basically now forced to have to set their own demands and have to set their own responsiveness. As a result of that, they don't tend to do well. And it's not out of things such as anger or aggression. It's mainly because they are forced to have to grow up too young, too early, and have to make decisions for themselves. And as a result of that, uh, the kid can often become disengaged in school, disengaged in responsibilities, disengaged in the ability to navigate because they're not used to that. They also may um, have a difficult time accepting help or getting help from other adults, even if those adults have good intentions, because the kid is not um, the kid is not used to having um, comforting adults who actually might try to help or support them and as a result they may reject that and as a result they do tend to make um, bad decisions but those bad decisions are not for the same reasons as permissive kids um, but they do tend to unfortunately still make bad decisions because they're often having to fend for themselves and, and do it as they go and that's just you know with no guidance and no no mentoring and that can be very difficult so then that brings me to the last of the four parenting styles um, this one is called authoritative. It is sometimes called democratic. Again, you'll notice democratic is even listed as an adjective there. Uh, authoritative parenting is, again, don't confuse it with authoritarian. Authoritarian is demanding but not responsive. Authoritative parenting is the best of both worlds. Yes, the parents are demanding, but they're reasonably demanding and they are there for the for responsiveness and warmth and support to help their kids reach those expectations. So authoritarian, authoritative parenting, authoritative parents may have high demands for their kids in terms of things like respect, responsibility, uh, grades, uh, accomplishments, things of that nature. However, those tend to be reasonably set reasonably, um, you know, uh, reasonable high expectations and standards, not irrational, not impossible, reasonable standards that are also flexible and considered. And there comes in the responsive and the warmth. So the parents are there, you know, to help them. To, to be there as a support system, to be empathetic and sympathetic. Also, authoritative parents, they do actually care about their kids' needs. They do care about their kids' opinions. Um, not everything is necessarily up for debate, and not everything is necessarily going to go the way the kid wants. However, authoritative parents are willing to negotiate. They're willing to listen to both sides. They're willing to, uh, punishments, for example, are often um, very clear, um, very uh, reasonable. They're not aggressive. They're not excessive. They're, they're very reasonable. They're thought out. They're explained. Authoritative parents tend to explain their reasoning behind their decisions on a curfew or this grade or why this you know, their child needs to do this or that or why it's expected of them. Uh, the punishments are often thought out and, and delivered um, with reasonable consideration. 
situation, the child's point of view is considered. It's not always taken into account so that it will change their mind. But for example, authoritative parents, as kids get older, they can start entertaining things like why it might be allowed for them to stay out later or to stay over more or why they can you know, start doing this or that if the child has shown that they are reliable and dependable and, and, and responsible, things like that. So the authoritative parent is flexible and negotiable. Um, they definitely do take into account their kids' opinions. They're, they encourage their kids to learn from their own mistakes. They're kind of there as a support system to be like, listen, you know, you know, we are here for you and we can help you. You know, so if you're struggling, if you want to do things on your own, that's fine. But we're also here as a support love system and you're here if you need us. So authoritative parenting, the kid tends to want to do well. Uh, they want to succeed. They often grow up in a home that fosters independence, uh, fosters communication, fosters responsibility, fosters uh, respect, fosters accomplishments and goals. And the parents often um, mimic those. They often demonstrate those. And so children who grew up in authoritative households tend to have high self-esteem. They often tend to be rather independent. They tend to be mature. They tend to make better decisions. Um, they tend to want to perform better, so they do tend to perform better in school. They tend to perform better um, in, in responsibilities, um, and they tend to have a relationship with their parents. Now, all teens, you know, it's, it can be strained at times, and it's not always going to go their way. But most of the time, authoritatively raised uh, children, often them and their parents have a mutual respect. And, you know, they're still an adult versus a child. They're not friends, per se, but they're as friendly as they can in a, a power dynamic that allows for one to help guide the other. So as a result, authoritative kids do tend to do well in school. They do tend to accomplish a lot. And they tend to be uh, more productive citizens, and they do tend to be more independent and, and, and free thinkers. And as a, they tend to have more empathy and sympathy for others uh, and things of that nature. So uh, that in a nutshell are the four parenting styles. Again, please know um, which ones are high and low on demand and responsiveness warmth. Uh, make sure you have some characteristics of all four. Have an idea of how the parents look in all four, how the kids would statistically likely turn out because of all four. Um, know like why, like you know, give me some reasons why three of them are bad and, and authoritative is good, and make sure uh, just have a clear understanding of basically this uh, this theory. Because again, this is commonly asked on the AP exam uh, almost every year. There's at least one question, a minimum of one question associated with this topic on the AP exam. Uh, also, frankly, many of you want to have kids, uh, and I'm assuming would like to raise them well. Um, so between what your parents have done right and wrong, and also things such as this that show you the kind of template or model to work with, hopefully that can give you an idea of the kind of parent you'd like to be based on the kind of kids I'm assuming you'd like to raise. So if you have any questions or concerns about this video, you're going to let me know. Otherwise, that's all I have for this one. Hopefully you've got it under control. If not, of course, any questions or concerns, you're going to let me know. And again, please check out um, some of the video links in the description below uh, to help you with some of this information.